Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome to the stream. I'm going to be making an oil painting today on top of a drawing that I completed. I'm not sure if I did a live stream of it when I was drawing it. So what I've actually done is I prepared a kind of time lapse of me doing the drawing and then... Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry, you just probably heard me broadcasting inside of this. Um, let me just roll that back. So. I'm going to be showing you a time lapse of the drawing being done and then me applying PVA to it and preparing it for oil painting. And if I get this right, I should just be able to click it once and you'll see the video. So let's see if I get this one to, uh, to work. Right. So this is the, um, the Raymar panel with the Stonehenge paper on it. And I'm drawing just with graphite pencils. Maybe there's a little bit of charcoal kind of thrown in there as well. And I'm just kind of progressing through and trying to kind of make a decent sketch. I think the whole thing probably took maybe, maybe I did it in about five or six hours. Uh, like the entire drawing kind of start to finish. And I didn't really have it in mind to actually paint on top of it, but I don't know. It sounded like a good idea afterwards. Now this is me applying the PVA size to it, which is just like a, um, a pH buffered glue that uh, kind of replaces what rabbit skin glue used to do, right? Um, and kind of seals the surface in between the oil and the actual paper itself. Uh, so let me just switch cameras now to the, uh, the live kind of painting cam. Um, and we can just like get down to business. If somebody in the comments would be kind enough to mention that the audio is doing just fine, I would super appreciate it because then I won't have to stress out about the audio being all messed up. All right, sound is <laughs> Some of you guys already anticipated my, uh, my question about that, so thanks. I've got on my palette today a, um, a flake white, a raw umber, a vermilion extra, and an ivory black. It's a little bit of a kind of risky palette because I'm kind of betting, I'm gambling that my raw umber from Becker's here, which has uh, a very light value and a very kind of yellowish hue, is actually going to do a bit of like double duty as my raw umber, but also as my yellow. So if this works out, then I sh it should look like I have a full kind of limited palette there but I'm actually taking the yellow-brown off my palette that, that's normally there. Really quick though, also I wanna mention, for those of you that are already on Patreon, great. For those of you that aren't, you might not know about it, but I'm starting off the Atelier tier, which is basically the beginning of the curriculum that I studied in an Atelier. Uh, of course, it's kind of you know changed completely into exactly what I want it to be, but we're going through some early master copy drawings and we're gonna go into cast drawing and eventually we're gonna take this all the way up into really advanced projects. But it's my way of kind of, I guess, creating a little bit of like an online school. The access to it is just $10 a month and you can take part in the live stream instructional demonstrations and also there's gonna be a feedback session. So dates to remember that are really important May 3rd is when the first live stream uh, instructional demo takes place. Uh, I'll be, you know, drawing and talking and answering your questions all the way through it. Then May 16th is the de deadline for you to give me your project, to submit your projects from the Atelier tier for what is going to be a feedback video that I'm going to make and release on that project. So May 3rd is the live stream. May 16th is going to be the live group critique. And then the following month, we're just going to keep going with, uh, with that theme. So let me just get down to business here because I got a lot to, um, I got a lot to work on uh, if I'm going to get anything right here. Uh, and also, by the way, yeah, we're talking about today like a really weird uh, topic. Uh, so last time I did a live stream, I decided I wanted to kind of focus in and like talk about one specific thing. And... The, uh, the first thing I thought of that was like completely universal to artists was failure, right? That if you're going to be an artist, you're going to be in like a creative career, you're inevitably going to experience one form or another of, of failure. And so I thought that was a great place to start. So then I decided, wouldn't it be great to just kind of flip that coin and actually talk about success, right? Because also it's something that I think, you know, quite universally, we're all striving for in one way or another, right? Like we got into this and we want to do like really well and we want to make great paintings and we want to have a career we want to do all these things so I, I just thought kind of unpacking some of the ideas around success would be really really interesting and um, i'm going to tell you some of my anecdotes and stories about it 
And uh, I hope that you'll also like uh, in the comments, like share some of your experiences and your reflections on it as well. Um, I thought the, the, the failure live stream was great because you guys were all like sharing uh, some really fantastic insights about it. Um, and so I felt like really at home kind of talking about that. So uh, there's a couple or actually a ton of comments that have already come in about it. The first one was from Abhishek Basak and he said, uh, Hi, Stephen, how do you define success and how could one get small wins from time to time to keep their confidence high, even if they know they are far from what they envision? This was actually, I thought, like a really cool place to start out um, just because, right, you know, what Abhishek is talking about here is, I think, the thing that we all deal with, which is how do you, um, how do you stay vital and stay encouraged and stay engaged when you know you're like not really at the level that you that you want to be at um, and I think it's something we can all kind of relate to uh, because our vision for what we want our work to do is is always going to be kind of ahead of the execution uh, of our work right so um, you know for me I think it's it's actually kind of an interesting place to uh, to talk about uh, the way I, I deal with it, which is, is I try to keep several different projects going. I have projects that I know I can do. I know I have projects that I know like I can finish and I know I'm capable of like at, at the level that I'm at. And I also have projects that are a little bit like kind of shot in the dark projects. Like I'm actually not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure like where the, um, where the end point is and like where I'm trying to get to with them there experiments in a sense, right? So I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, can I do this? I'm trying to like push myself to like another, uh, another level um, with some of these projects. The thing is, like, if you do all one kind of project, if you if you only do these like, shoot for the moon kind of projects, I think, uh, you know, as Abhishek is kind of talking about here, I, I think um, that you can feel like, oh, you're, you're never really you're pouring in all this time you're not really de deriving much of a result, which, which that's, like, that's like the source of frustration. That's like the feeling of failure, right? Is that you pour in your time over and over and over, and then you feel like nothing comes out of it. So, you know, just try and strike a balance with the, the, the kinds of projects you take on, you know? Um, I've talked before uh, in streams and things with students about how I know that, that as artists, we get like really enthusiastic and we usually kind of start out a project before we're really ready to start it out. And I think that's like, for sure, one way to um, make success a lot more difficult is to, to not be prepared for, for success, right? Like, you know, do you have all the right materials? Do you have like the studio setup that you want? Do you have the right source images? You know, all these things kind of contribute to success. Like people that prepare are, are generally speaking, like people that are going to have an easier time uh, succeeding. Um, and so my advice to, to you, Abhishek, would just be to um, try your best to, to strike a balance in, uh, in terms of the skill level required for the projects that you're, you're trying to accomplish. Give yourself an e easy win every now and then, basically. <laughs> it's it's kind of what it boils down to, right? Um, so let's see. JD Anarchy was asking, what is success in art? Is it when you're happy with your art? Or is it only when you make money off of it? Yeah, I think, you know, JD, that, you know, there's not necessarily, I don't know if we necessarily have to draw a line in between those two. Uh, and I, I kind of made some notes about this to myself and I was kind of thinking about this, this stream and this topic beforehand. Um, and I was thinking about, well, you know, for me, if I have to tell you like what success is for me, you know, it probably like varies a little bit like at different points in my career. But, but I, I do know that for me, like it's very important to be to be like sustainable, to be self-sustaining from my art. Like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And, you know, I just need to make sure that it's providing, you know, what it's supposed to provide for, for my life, right? So I need, I need income. And I also need to be like satisfied with my, my work. Now, now, this is something that I think let, let's talk about this because one of the things that JD's doing in that comment is kind of creating these two different categories. Uh, you know, is it only making money off your art or is it being satisfied with your art? I think success is inevitably going to be like a combination of those two things, right? Uh, and, and that's how I'd encourage you to, to, to conceptualize your, 
your version of success is is try not to be like uh, binary about it. Try to to think, how do I do exactly the thing that I want to do, and and combine that with the kind of like success like out there in the world that's necessary to uh, uh, to kind of keep making more of it, right? You know, this there's like this idea that like commissions, you know, uh, commission paintings and things have to be a pain. Um, you know, I always like uh, bristle a little bit when I, I see like artists on social media like complaining about oh commissions, commissions, commissions. I think like you know like the Sistine ceiling was a commission, man. You know, <laughs> like um, and it's up to you like as an artist. I think if you're going to take that on, and, and and let's read this as if you're going to take on an art career, that really you have this great responsibility to find a way to satisfy kind of both of those um, criteria. You know, satisfying just one. I don't think that's, for me at least, that's that's not my version of uh, uh, of success, you know. Um, which kind of brings me to one of the points, that I, kind of one of the notes that I made. I remember someone said to me like years ago, they were talking about kind of painting and their career and stuff, and they were saying like, there's like there's way better ways to make money than to be an artist, <laughs> you know. So like, if your aim or if your goal was to like make money, just you know, just. I would say probably do something else, like go be an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, be an app designer or, or work in the tech sphere or, or something where, where I think like probably money uh, flows a little bit more freely. Because um, if you're going to be an artist, you know, it's, it's going to be, I think it's going to be really challenging. And so you do have to take some of your success from the work. You know, I derive a lot of satisfaction from just the fact that I can sit down and I can actually make a portrait of somebody. I can start with a blank sheet of paper and I can, you know, end up with, uh, you know, what we have now, which is sort of halfway through. But still, you know, that that was something that took like a really long time to to figure out and to to be able to execute. Um, and so, you know, I really I put a lot of stock and a lot of appreciation in in that accomplishment, you know. Uh, whereas like if all I needed to do was like make paintings to make money, maybe I'd be, I'd try and, no, I don't want to like disparage anybody here, but maybe I'd be like a photorealist. So I just like project everything onto my canvas and I'd get in there with tiny brushes and just uh, make paintings that, uh, you know, have this kind of undisputable appeal, right? Like everybody in the world loves kind of a, a photorealist painting or, or they're very impressed by it at least, you know, it seems, uh, Galleries can always uh, find room for for hyperrealism and, and photorealism because it, because it is so impressive, right? Um, but for me, that's not necessarily that's not where I wanted to be, you know. So uh, I guess also, you know, something I wanted to say was I remember this so distinctly from my my student career, you know. And you get this around academies sometimes, I think too, is that they 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 tend to be like really kind of binary in the way they think about things, like. You know, you can either be successful or you can be um, uh, kind of good at what you do um, and you kind of have to choose. And I, I just think, yeah, that's for me, that's like way too, um, that's way too like oversimplified, you know. Um, I think that you, I think that you want to be successful and you want to do what you want to do. Um, but yes, more questions coming in about it. Dwayne DeCock is asking, do you think having a large social media following is essential to be a successful artist? No, no, I don't, I don't actually think so. The, um, I mean, we're a little bit like in between generations right now. Like where, I know like when I grew up, I, um, yeah, I was born in 1980 and, uh, and so we were just on the edge of like starting to have the internet when I was... Um, now, when I was younger, you know, when I was in my teens, and I grew up, like, of course, as a child, like, there just, it just wasn't there, you know? Um, and you have, you have a lot of artists who have been working, uh, you know, proficiently and professionally since long before, you know, uh, uh, social media existed, even, or the internet existed, you know? There's still people out there, you know, like, uh, um, having careers that, that, that started, like I said, without any of that. Um, and the point I want to make about it really is just that, um, you know, I think for younger artists, I think what the internet has done and what social media has done is it's actually allowed you to be in control of your career kind of for the first time. I mean, it's not that artists out there didn't like 
kind of start their own brick and mortar galleries and like do stuff like that. But it was just, I think, far more rare to find like an artist doing it themselves. Whereas like nowadays, I feel like it's almost like if you're not in some way or other like doing it a little bit yourself, I feel like, wow, you know, like you, I don't know, I feel like you're missing out, you know? <laughs> also because, you know, I've talked before about like, you know, kind of art sales and, and, and kind of finding that traditional success of like just selling your work. And, you know, a big part of that is, you know, telling the story of your, of your work. And I, I just always think like, who, who better to tell the story of your work and why your work is like interesting and, and cool than you, right? <laughs> um, and I think social media is the way that we do that. The, you know, it's the way that we talk about, you know, not just what's great about our work, we can talk about our struggles and things too, uh, but it's also a place where you can, you can kind of communicate to people what your intent as an artist was in, in kind of making a piece. And I think that's just so, there's such a freedom in that. Um, so in terms of, you know, experiencing success, I highly recommend, uh, you know, making friends with social media. Um, and to do that, probably you have to take that non-binary mindset, right? It's not, I can be successful on social media or I can have, be an artist that has integrity. You can be both. Right, so let's see. A lot of questions coming in. By the way, you know, I'm just gonna prioritize uh, a little bit the uh, questions uh, related to the topic. So. Let's see. JD Paper says, the success in art seems like who you know in the art industry is more important than your skills and talent. <laughs> talent. Am I so cyn too cynical? Well, naturally, I mean, let's, uh, you know, I mean, we can take the cynical angle on it or we can just take the practical angle on it and say that does it help to like network and to know people? Well, yeah, I mean, that's true in like literally any industry that you go into. Like, I don't know, I don't know the industry that exists out there that's 100% meritocracy, you know, I mean, there's naturally going to be um, instances where people that have like similar backgrounds and similar interests that they find that they work well together. So, you know, I, I just, I would take it just with a grain of salt and say like, you know, I mean, that's just that's humanity 101 <laughs> a little bit like I, f I feel like that you know you can either let it get you down or or as you say like make you feel a little bit cynical or you can just say like well that's the the playing field and i can say that 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 you can succeed without that you know so uh, i think that it's not it's not like a prerequisite to to know somebody um but certainly like for a very long time you know knowing somebody has been um a good way to get your foot in the door. And um, I think we should just look at it as, you know, that's just kind of how things are sometimes. And that's, you can be angry about it or, or not. I, I don't know, I don't have any really feeling about it at all. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've been introduced to a gallery through somebody that I knew, um, who I'd actually, this is funny, I'd actually emailed this gallery, right? And they completely ghosted, like they didn't, you know, respond at all to the email. And then I asked this friend of mine, like, hey, you know, you know them. Could you just say like, oh, hey, you should check out this artist. And they like got back to me like immediately. So, you know, yeah, like it, it, it exists. Um, is it kind of a bummer sometimes? Like, yeah, I don't know, I guess so. But I feel like it's, you, you also have that option nowadays where if that really does bum you out, like you don't need to play that game. Like, there's a lot of ways nowadays to um, to achieve like kind of commercial success as an artist. It's not kind of just down to can I can I get into a gallery um, anymore anyway. So uh, let's see other questions coming in. Let's see. Limo Art is asking if there will be a short YouTube video from the Atelier tier. As much as possible, I try and share like at least like smaller clips, like, I mean, the live streams themselves are about three hours. So I try and share like a 10, 15 minute clip of, of each, uh, each atelier or teaching live stream that I do. Uh, so definitely you can kind of get access to them. 
Uh, however, like also, you know, even on Patreon, there's even like a five dollar tier, which I release some videos on, like obviously, like you know, limited to the the beginning parts of projects and things. Uh, but um, there's a lot of like entry level stuff that I think that 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 you can do there. And um, but I, I'll I'll try. I'll definitely try. It's just like you know, I gotta do the editing, right? Uh, so let's see. MJ is asking, after making a successful drawing, what do you do if the next drawing isn't so successful? <laughs> I think that, um, you know, naturally we have varying degrees of kind of accomplishment. And I think this is, you know, MJ is kind of touching on, I think, a topic that's really kind of interesting in this, which is like with our work, you know, how do we, how are we like allowed to feel about the process versus the result. Now this for me was, uh, I think, something that took a long time to understand because you hear, I think, all the time, like the rhetoric that you hear is, well, you always have to just, it's just about the process. You can't think about the result. And, you know, I, I think one of the reasons that's so hard to parse out is that, you know, when you're a professional, you kind of do have to think about the results. Like I'm a results-oriented person. You know, if I if I was doing this for I don't know five years, and everything I did was just you know totally divorced from what I wanted it to be, didn't even come close. I'm not sure. Like I'm not sure that I would be able to totally just take that in stride. You know, like I would be, I would get really down about that. So I, I just, you know, for me, I would just say to people like, hey, it's, it's all right to think about the, the, the result, you know, but that is actually where it gets interesting. Is if you say like, okay, I do want to think about the result. The result matters to me. But in order to get a good result, guess what? You have to respect the process. So once again, like it's not either or. It's not like you need to respect the result or you need to respect the process to be successful or to make successful work. It's that you, I don't think you get to a good result without a great process. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of taking that, that holistic view and trying your best not to like kind of close avenues, you know, because a lot of times, like when I think about the process, uh, you know, that I, that I use, you know, part of what I used to evaluate how successful that process was, you know, is did it come to a good result? Because more often than not, if your process is, is really flawed, well, guess what? That's a big part of why you didn't come up to a, a, a good result. So um, I say you marry those two together. Um, in terms of like self-evaluation, you know, when you, when you do an unsuccessful drawing, sometimes, sometimes not everything is a lesson. <laughs> sometimes a drawing just doesn't work out. Sometimes a painting just doesn't work out. You did all the stuff you were supposed to do and at the end, you realized, and you know, instead of you know a dark key, it should have been a light key, and you're way beyond fixing that, uh, and you just have to kind of move on. And I, I think that in terms of success, you know, there's there's a lot of like stock sayings from CEOs and stuff about success. Uh, but there's one that I'll I'll kind of paraphrase here, uh, but it's something about like you know, successful people generally have like failed more often than unsuccessful people, right? Uh, so it's that quality of being able to continue, you know, pushing yourself and continue striving, even when sometimes, you know, you don't get the result that you're looking for, you know, you just, you keep, you know, and that's, oh, you know, by the way, talking about success, if there's a quality, right, that I feel like in, in students leads more often to success than just about anything else. And I would even, even put this, not above, but on par with talent, is tenacity, right? That ability to just keep pushing, you know, because even, even people with a tremendous amount of talent, I, I think very often, you know, they don't, they don't just come out of the womb that way. They don't, you know, it's not like you, because you're, you're talented, you know, it is your, um, what's the word? It's not like your birthright to, to make great work. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, you see all the time, like really talented people, like really talented students, 
that don't go on to be very prolific artists. You know, it happens all the time. You know, discipline plays such a big part in in success. I think for for artists, partially because it's such a labor intensive field. Like this is a a field that is going to require long hours, lots of work, lots of focus, and and sometimes you know the the returns on that are a little bit lean. You know, it can feel like you're not maybe getting everything out that 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 is equal to what you put in. Um, so to a certain extent, you just got to respect that and kind of kind of move on a little bit. Let's see. Cat K Cat is asking, can you please talk about the commissions you did? How was your experience? It varies, uh, and um, you know nowadays I'm I'm really you know happy and and really uh, pleased that I'm in a place where you know with my work. I've gotten my process to to a place where if I want to take a commission and I want to execute it, you know, I, I'm pretty well able to. That that thought that I had or that feeling that I had early on that like I was kind of rolling the dice, right? <laughs> Don't tell any of the people that commissioned me early on in my career, but you know, it was kind of a roll of the dice that like, well, this could either come out good or not. I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> You know, but I, you know, I need the money, so I, I kind of try it out. Um, but so, so like I, I, I've done commissions where, you know, I mean, really early on, where when I was going to deliver them, I just didn't know what kind of response I was going to get. You know, maybe they're just going to say, "I don't like this at all. I don't want anything to do with this." Um, that that, that could have happened. Uh, I, I thankfully, I've, I've never exactly been in that that situation. But you know, I'm, I'm just saying, like it. It wasn't out of the um, the realm of possibility uh, in terms of you know delivering a work that that may or may not have been any good. Lately, I've been really fortunate that, like I said, you know, um, the approach that I take to my work that's very calm and cool and collected allows me to to work pretty efficiently on on commissions. And you know, one of the things that 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 made me really happy is actually just before I was, we were leaving the states, uh, a really uh, good friend. Um, uh, it's a couple, uh, um, but she commissioned me to to paint her husband, and he's a great friend of mine. It's, it's just a marriage made in heaven. I was so happy to uh, uh, to do it. Um, but you know, it reminds me actually of a, uh, a question that I remember overhearing when I was at the academy. Uh, some student was, you know, the director of the school was like in the studio, and uh, the students were like just following him around, like asking questions and asking questions, and. Uh, one of them asked, uh, oh, what is the hardest thing to paint? <laughs> Which is like kind of a funny question because, I mean, if you paint, like, you know, anything out there can be like hard to paint. It's not, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, he's not going to say like, oh, oranges. You know what I mean? It's not going to be like a question uh, that, that is answered like that. Uh, but I, I thought at the time, like, and I, I still think now, like he had a really brilliant answer. He said, uh, essentially something you don't care about. Like that's probably the hardest thing to uh, to paint is something where you don't actually feel really engaged with it. You know, you don't really care about it. Now, back to that kind of Sistine ceiling uh, thing that I brought up, right? I mean, part of your job in taking commission is finding that thing to connect to, right? Finding, you know, that way to that way into the the process for you, you know. Uh, like taking, for instance, you know, one like one of the most difficult things I think that you'll ever get commissioned to do is when you get one of those commissions that's posthumous, right? So uh, someone has a loved one who has passed away, and they're commissioning you to paint a portrait of that person. <sighs> like that is such a daunting ask. I think you know, I think of that as an artist, and I'm I'm like, wow. I mean, I don't know, like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to like capture the joy and light and life in that person that, that you saw, you know and I mean? That's kind of what you have to do with a commission is you have to, you have to remember and respect the fact that you're painting most often at someone that somebody really, really cares about. And when they see that person, right, they're seeing so much more than just their appearance, right? They're seeing, uh, that person that they that they love and all the time that they spent together with them and all the memories they have you know it's all this accumulation of of kind of feeling and emotion and and, and history you know and and your job 
is to kind of respect that and try to imbue that in the in the portrait. Um, so so it's really really challenging and um, you know again like for posthumous portraits I think uh, particularly so. Um, I, of course, I, I haven't done any commission like that in, um, I don't know, I mean, it's been since before I was even really a professional. I think I was just a, um, a young artist uh, with my studio in this little arts complex uh, trying to scrape a living together um, from, from my work, you know. Uh, but yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, so if you ever get those, you know, you've got to be... Uh, I think extra on your toes about um, yeah about the uh, the grace with which you uh, accept clients' input. That's the other thing too is like when you're doing a commission. I think it's important to maybe remember like um, they're going to have input and like that's okay. Like that that's totally all right. You can't you can't like kind of take it personal because in a way they're they're paying you to kind of be their hands, right? Like they they want. They, they want to see this portrayed in paint, but it's also they kind of want to see, like, I think, like their vision portrayed in paint. Uh, and so you, you want to be mindful of the fact that, that, you know, the first time that you send them, you know, how it's going or whatever, they're going to have something to say about it. And that's, that should be totally okay. You should plan for that, right? Um, and just kind of as gracefully as possible, accept it and kind of work with them and if you feel like they're, if you feel like really it's not something that can work out, I think sometimes you just got to take and say, well, you know, for the next time, maybe, maybe I, I try and get to know what the project is about before I, I take the commission. But this is kind of hard to, once you've kind of put some work in, uh, to just um, abandon the, uh, the, the project. Also, there's financial implications, which is actually one of the reasons, and, and I'll mention this as well, uh, it's going to be a hard one to, to swallow, but... When I take a commission, I, I always actually take a 50% deposit that's not refundable uh, because usually I've like talked to the client, I've kind of tried to see if their vision meets my vision and, and that we're, we're going to work on something that works for both of us. And so like if they get to a place where they're finally like signing an agreement, signing a contract with me, uh, I feel like we're in a safe place where we can both say like, I'm going to invest the time and you're going to invest the money. And, and we're going to come to a kind of successful conclusion about this. Uh, but it's like, it's a, it's a partnership, for sure. Let's see. Valerie is saying, following on from DJ's question, you have to add in social media, does having thousands of followers make you successful? I don't think so. But I know a lot of people now quantify this as success. Yeah, I think that yeah, kind of depends. I mean... You know, let's say, for instance, right, like um, when, when I started on social, when I started on Instagram, uh, maybe it's like six years ago or something like that now, I didn't, I had no, I had no actual interest in being on Instagram. Uh, it was one of those things where uh, I was at the studio and like a colleague of mine was talking about Instagram and, uh, and was like, oh, you should, you should have an account. And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know. I was still in this, like, oh, I don't, you know, like technology, really, you know, uh, place. And so I kind of was reluctant about it. Uh, but she was like, yeah, no, no, you should do it, you should do it, you should do it. So whatever, like I started an account and, you know, posted to it. Because you do, like you get into it and you start posting to it. And, and slowly, like a following kind of took shape. And that was really cool. Uh, you know, so at that point does the quantity of followers you have really matter? No, like not at all. Not at all. Um, however, right, if you're, I mean, now, nowadays looking at it, I mean, effectively, it's like, it's my job, you know, my, my job is to be an online instructor and to help people, you know, climb over that barrier of entry into what is a very challenging educational experience, right? So, do do I watch like my follower growth and think, oh, I need to listen, I need to really like step it up and like, you know, make sure that I'm creating the right kind of content. Yeah, well, yeah, this is my job. Like if, if, if I wasn't, if I wasn't keeping my follower count and my growth up, then I wouldn't be doing my job. So at this point, it's kind of different. If you're casually on social media, I don't think it matters like 
like zero at all like who cares like if you're I mean it's nice you know or whatever but but it doesn't like it doesn't mean anything you know I mean this you can put it out of your mind that it's tied to the quality of your work it's it's really not about that uh, you know there's a lot of different levels of quality at which people are having you know successful experiences and you know lots of followers on on social media uh, you know so it's really it's really not about that um, a lot of it's actually just about uh, and, and if you want, like, you know, social media 101, in a world where not everybody is capable of being disciplined and showing up every day, that becomes a skill. And so one of the things that you can do, and I've, you know, read this in various places, it's not like any new advice. Uh, but what you really have to do if you want to grow a following is sh like make a schedule, show up every day, like make content every day for about six months. And if after you've done that, you're still like not experiencing any growth, then you can have a conversation about, well, is there something qualitatively wrong with what I'm producing? But because that's probably the thing that, that actually is the stumbling block for most people on social media is having the, the, the discipline to like show up every day. And, and by the way, going back to success in, in painting and so on, listen, it's not that different. You know, have, have you drawn or painted 100 heads? If you have, great. How are you feeling about your level of success at this point? Now we can talk about whether you feel good or bad about it or whatever. But, but if you're like under that 100 head threshold and you're looking at your work and you're going, oh, I don't know what's wrong with it, I, I'm not making progress and so on, Ain't about that. It's about mileage. Uh, now, mileage with great concepts and mileage with great instruction, I mean, hey, that's like, you know, supercharging. But, you know, the, the, the mileage is, is probably the primary accelerator um, in terms of, you know, the assimilation of ideas and um, the increase in your, in your skill level. Um, so you got to show up. That's the first thing. And, and, and oddly enough, it sounds like really simple. It's really hard. It's really hard to show up, you know, like something uh, MJ was asking earlier about like, well, what do you do when one of your drawings is pretty good and the next one's pretty bad? Well, you just show up the next day and you try and do better the next day, you know, and it's not, it's not complicated, but it's, uh, it's not easy either, right? Like, I think we can all probably relate to that, you know, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's hard. So, yeah. Let's see. Lamello Art is saying, I know that Auguste Rodin has not sculpted himself. And he had other pro sculptors that worked for him. Um, if you mean that he hasn't sculpted himself like a self-portrait, yeah, but if he's not sculpted at all, that's, that is untrue. Actually, there was an interesting thing. If you know Rodin's sculpture, the, uh, the Age of Bronze, which is... I think one of my one of my kind of favorite sculptures of his. It's um, uh, it, it's almost kind of like neoclassical in the kind of pose that it that it takes, uh, and and it's very kind of you know dramatic as as a lot of Rodin is. Um, but I heard this anecdote that that at the salon in which like it came out when he first showed it, there was all this speculation that actually it, rather than a sculpture, it was a life casting, and. So, because it was like a life-size sculpture, right? And so they, they were thinking it was so like, it was so true, it was so, it had so much uh, uh, truth in it, like so much reality in it, that they felt, oh, this must be like a life casting, like he actually hasn't sculpted this. And so, subsequently, uh, he did a lot of sculptures that were actually lower than, than life-size, because of course, this would dispel the myth that he had, that he had uh, taken life cast, because you can't, Take a smaller than life ca life life cast. Uh, wh whether or not that's like true or, or not, I think it uh, you know it definitely speaks to Rodin's um, capacities as a sculptor and uh, yeah, like he definitely predominantly did his work. Now, if you're talking about his marble sculptures, right? Like a lot of the marbles that are in the Rodin corridor at the Metropolitan in New York. I, I do understand that a lot of those actually were done by by marble carvers uh, that either he had made, you know, for instance, the uh, like maquettes in clay and um, uh, certainly they were made like under his direction. Uh, but but yeah, perhaps it's, I've heard that that, yeah, that he was not um, 
he was not like actively working on those. I, I mean, it gets a little bit murky. I'm not actually sure if, how much how much truth is in that. So let's see. Ben Small. Oh, wait a minute. No, there's another question. <laughs> uh, Dwayne DeCock is asking, what are the most important steps in successfully telling a story with your art? Well, I think one of the things that is kind of a prerequisite is actually knowing what your work is about. And, and that, you know, is actually really a challenging one because, you know, I think when we start out, there's a lot of language that we don't have, you know, for, for artwork. Like I was having, so I, I do like these uh, mentorship uh, sessions with students where, you know, we kind of, you know, they show me their work and we talk about it and we talk about improvements and all these other things. Uh, but I've started to take these sessions where actually we put their work aside for a moment and I ask them to give me images to put on a mood board, right, that is representative of like what kind of art they like, you know, so what their taste is essentially, you know. So they'll send me, you know, pictures of De Laszlo paintings and pictures of Marc De Lazio paintings and uh, you know, a group, you know, of like 10 to 15 works. And we put them all up on a, on a Photoshop uh, um, file together and just kind of go into them and talk about, well, what is, it, what is it about this work, you know, that is, you know, shares like a common thread with the other works on this mood board? Like, you know, to try to get down to the bottom, basically, of what it is they like. Because so much of what we appreciate it's a little bit unconscious, especially as a student, because you can't say things like, oh, well, I love the line quality in this, in this work, or the linear structure in this work, because at a certain point, you don't even know what that is, right? Like, I didn't know what linear structure was uh, when I first started out. In fact, I remember in college, like, getting assignments to do line drawings and just being totally, completely nonplussed. Like, I, I had, I, you know, I don't know how to do a line. I don't know what what lines I'm supposed to choose, like how does it, does it just, you know, drawing a stick man is like that, <laughs> what a line drawing is. Like I really, really didn't have any idea. And so what we did is we, we kind of talked for an hour about just about her taste and what, what she really enjoyed and getting down to like a granular level to like what is, what is the language of the brush strokes in the work that you like. Are they, are they flat and straight? Are they like fluid and, and, uh, and kind of flowing uh, and, and really organic, you know? Things like that are super indicative of like what your taste actually is. Once you understand what your taste is, then I think you can start to consciously consider what kind of work that you want to make. You know, we all start out probably, you know, let's just be honest, we all probably start out in a very unconscious place in our, our work. You know, it's, we, we started drawing when we were kids and we love drawing and so, then we just kept doing it and now we're painting and we're doing this and that and and I think it's super helpful like at a certain point you just stop and go like what you know what are the things that I that I like that I love to look at in artwork and is the work that I'm making does that match up you know uh, and she was saying to me also like she she was like yeah you know I, I love this work by Delaslo and Sargent and Mark Delaslo and all these painters um, and there are all these like really rapid painters, like painters that, that work really fast uh, and, and usually like kind of complete a lot of things in one session. She was saying like, and I'm studying at this, uh, you know, I, I'll not say any names about where, but like studying at the school that's really, really like meticulous. And she was saying like, I know that if you study meticulously, you know, you can always loosen up and stuff. And like, that's definitely true. Like you can. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm probably proof that in a way, you, you can do that because I studied at a school that was really, uh, of the academies, is probably one that appreciates a lot more like brush strokes rather than rendering. Um, but I've, I've, I really wanted to learn actually a lot about rendering. Uh, getting to the point, what I wanted to say was that basically you, you, you do kind of become what you train to become. You know, like painting is not unlike, uh, you know, carpentry in a sense that it's like a pretty hard skill and not, not hard, but like it's a, it's a practical skill and the processes that you use will definitely inform the work that, that you make. So if you're training to be this really tight painter, 
but you love like loose fluid brush strokes, I think it's worth considering whether or not you're, you're really studying what, what you want to study. Anyway, I digress. Let's see. Um, let's see, Ben Small is saying, yes, we know his name. The great workers are not known or recognized. The modern world is much better that we can communicate with each other. Yes. Oh yeah, so back to Dwayne's question, like what are the, the most important steps in, in, um, in telling your, your story as an artist? Uh, like I said, I think first it's like kind of knowing yourself, like knowing where you're coming to it from. Uh, I think after that, um, obviously working on creating, uh, like actually manifesting that taste on a canvas. You know, I mean, that's, that's, of course, we're all in various stages of that. And I don't want to say like, oh, you have to make perfect work to like put it out there and just kind of see what happens. I think actually the opposite. I feel like you should be, you know, you should be, we live in a kind of open world, you know, you should be okay with like just putting your work out there. It's not going to be perfect, uh, you know, and, and that's okay. Like nobody actually thinks oh, their work is, my work is perfect, <laughs> you know? Uh, like, I didn't think that before I started showing, and I don't think that now. Um, uh, but, you know, I persevere, and I go on, and I just try and do my, my best. Um, uh, but I think that it's worth noting that, you know, you do, if you're going to tell the story of, like, what your work is about, I think making sure that you're manifesting what your work is about in the work that you produce is obviously very important. Uh, so, so that is a big, a big part of it. But after that, you know, telling your story is also about like being engaged and like keeping people engaged. Uh, you know, I think there's this idea that, you know, with social that, you know, everybody out there says like, oh, it's just like, just make great content, right? Well, yeah, like actually all the content you make, like isn't consistently great like every single time that's like only make great paintings well i can't do that like i'm not a machine uh i can't like make a perfect painting every time uh and you can't make great content every time but what you can do is show up and and by doing so you're going to get better at at making that content right um so just try to this is kind of you know odd to say because it's social media but to, i think just try to be really genuine about it like I, I have no interest, you know, or, 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 and I've never really engaged too much with the like kind of grow quick schemes, you know, like, uh, this kind of giveaway or that kind of contest, you know, uh, um, uh, I feel like all that stuff's a little bit red herring and you should just kind of focus on making genuine posts and making them consistently and, uh, see where that takes you. And if, like I said, if after six months of doing that, you feel like you're getting nowhere, I mean, then you can start to think about alternative routes. Let's see. Ben Small is asking, how would you call the division of time you make as a percentage teaching commission own interests? Um, it doesn't really relate to the success topic, uh, but I'll just give you a brief breakdown. I rarely do commissions, uh, so it's mostly like teaching and, and painting my own projects. Uh, and then I would say of the time that I spend at the easel, it's probably 50-50. Uh, luckily, at least when I'm teaching, I still get to paint stuff. <laughs> uh, let's see. Dardanian is, Dardanian Warrior is asking, Hello, Stephen, did the Atelier tier, is it going to include figure drawing and painting and cast painting in the future? Yes. Serge Gallagher is asking, I've done posthumous portraits for a child. Whew, tough, tough one. Yeah. Um, Valerie is asking, I have a posthumous one waiting to go, a posthumous uh, portrait commission uh, of a lady who passed away from COVID in January. Super nerve-wracking, but I've painted them uh, before at least. Very, very challenging, of course, yeah. Abhinav says, hi, Stephen. Where do you get your references from? I shoot them all myself. Um, so I'm just going to look for now like some, some more comments about, about success uh, so we kind of stay on topic here. Let's see. Victor Pieri is saying, I'm not going to compare, but would you recommend the Florence Academy uh, for a looser approach in terms of brush strokes and GCA for more rendered approach? I think that's genu genu generally the vibe. Yeah. Um, and then Callum Gillespie is saying, hi, Stephen, thanks for your content. Just want to say that your content has helped me massively. 
very cool. Uh, and then he's had his first pieces in an exhibition online this week. Good job, good job. Uh, so, all right, so I just want to, um, I'm going to tell a story here that, <laughs> that I have never successfully been able to tell uh, <laughs> without like getting like really emotional about it. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. This could be uh, uh, a disaster uh, and embarrassing. But um, I was asked earlier, right, like, what do you think of as, as success? And like, what does that, that kind of mean to you, like in your work? And again, like I've, I've told the story at like several, uh, like I've given like lectures and things and, and, you know, inevitably the topics of career come up and stuff and you kind of wind up mentioning stuff like this. I've never been able to tell this one without like getting a little bit choked up about it. And I'm gonna try and do that here. I'm gonna be like, shh, like totally as, as uh, uh, down the middle as I can be. Uh, but if you know this musician called Frankie Valli, right? He was like this kind of doo-wop era singer from, pretty sure he was from New Jersey, right? And then uh, eventually like Clint Eastwood made a, a, a movie called uh, The Jersey Boys, which is kind of a musical and Event, like I actually don't really like musicals at all. Uh, some, for some reason, my wife and I wound up watching it. Um, but he became like really wildly famous. Uh, you know, had an incredible singing voice and all that. And you know, they were. You know, there was this moment in the in the film where it kind of breaks away into this like interview with him, and uh, they were talking about asking about like, well, Frankie, you know, what was the best part of your career? Was it the the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, or was it the all the, the number one hit singles, you know, or the, uh, was it playing in front of 60,000 person audiences, you know, in the, uh, <laughs> it's already happening, uh, playing in front of 60,000 person audiences, you know, uh, at stadiums and things. What was, what was your, you know, the, 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 the high point for you in your entire career? And just as I just guaranteed you, it's happening that I, I'm getting choked up about it. He said, uh, he responded to this question by saying that, you know, <laughs> damn it, <laughs> sorry, pardon my language. Um, he said, no, like, actually, when we were just teenagers and we were like, just the four of us or five of us or whatever, like, practicing, like, singing together in harmonies, like, under the street light on a corner in Jersey City, and like, our entire journey <laughs> was out in front of us. Like that was for him, like the most amazing thing. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> to get back to uh, success, um, I think there's that sense that that feeling that you have when you start all this stuff out. I think, you know, being successful, you don't ever want to forget about nurturing that feeling that, that you had that, that caused you to start doing this stuff in the first place. I can't believe it. I actually rehearsed telling this story to my wife beforehand so that I would maybe like get it out of the way. But, but uh, just as sure as it has always happened, it happens this time too. But like I said, uh, I do feel like, you know, entering into like a binary mindset where you're saying I'm either going to be successful or I'm going to nurture my art. I feel like that's the first way to like not be successful. Um, I think it's the thing that leads to cynicism. Uh, I think eventually, you know, you can probably become a pretty unhappy person uh, working that way. Um, and in the long run, I think in the long run, you're going to lose also your, your kind of passion for what you're doing as well. Um, I, I can say like I'm 40 now and, you know, I've been, I've been doing more or less like kind of the same thing for, for 20 years uh, as a career. And you go through like crests and valleys in terms of like your appreciation for for art and your like the joy that you take from it i mean sometimes you just feel like overworked and uh and underappreciated and and that that's that's a tough thing to kind of go through um but i know also that you're gonna get a lot more of that feeling if if you kind of take that 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 harsh binary approach and say like i'm either going to be successful or i'm going to like do what I, what I love, you know, the, the smartest people, I think the most successful people, people that have the longest careers, those are going to be the ones that are, that didn't, didn't try to compromise that, right? Uh, 
but like, let's also bear in mind, not all compromise is the same. Uh, I, did, I didn't mention this earlier. I think I started down this line, but I never, I never got to actually the point of it. Um, once you know like what you like and what, what you love in, in, in work and, and the kind of work that you want to make, you can also understand that like not every kind of compromise is equally, you know, equally tarnishes your experience, I guess, right? So there's some things like you can know, <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave the name of this artist actually out of it. Uh, but when I was a student, there was a, a, a guy at the studio that, that, uh, um, that I, was, uh, I was at when I was, when I was working where he was saying, and he was actually, you know, even successful at the time as a student, like he was out there, you know, selling paintings in the tens of thousands of dollars, you know? Uh, and he said to me like, yeah, you know, if you're gonna be successful, you know, you, you figure, make figurative work and be successful, you're gonna, you're gonna paint uh, pretty girls and tough looking guys. Like that's, that's the formula, right? Um, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna succeed in this, in this business, that's, that's what it's gonna be. And, you know, I mean, he said it laughingly and ma maybe it was a total joke and maybe it wasn't, but there's like a kernel of truth in that, that, that like actually, you know, if you look at most, you know, successful artists out there kind of painting, like, I mean, I'm talking like people that are showing and selling out, right? More often than not, yeah, this is going to be pretty girls and stuff looking guys. Like that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's just consumer culture, you know? Uh, and if you're going to be successful, like kind of selling your your work, you, you kind of do have to like appeal to the public in that in that sense. Um, the question is, how much does that matter to you, right? Like, how much does it matter to you? Like, I because I, I asked myself that question when when I heard him say that. Like, well, is it important to me that I paint like gnarly looking old dudes? Like, is that like is that important to my vision that I paint gnarly looking old dudes? And if it is, then I say you paint those gnarly looking old dudes and you find, you find another criteria to help collectors connect with, uh, with your work. Uh, if it's not important to you, like if, it, if you really like, oh, eh, whatever, you know, I just like to paint stuff. And if it's pretty people, great. Uh, if it's, you know, uh, gnarly looking people, great. Well, then guess what? That, that, that's okay. I think that's like totally fine. Um, you know, if you... If you like love still life, I think still life and landscape painting are, are really great ways to be kind of commercially successful as an artist just because, you know, they're so, they're so decorative, right? Um, which, by the way, it sounds scandalous to call something decorative when you're an artist. But realistically, yeah, like a lot of work is, is decorative and that's, that's like totally okay uh, just to make decorative work. I, I mean, even, even my portraits for, for however much I try to give them this psychology and really, um, you know, really try to make something bold and touching uh, with them and to, to show everything about my appreciation of design. Like, yeah, they're also decorative, you know, they, they will look nice on a, on a wall, you know, behind uh, a beautiful desk or uh, <laughs> next to a flower arrangement. You know, artwork is a decorative thing and, and um, you shouldn't you shouldn't feel like you, you have to be making work that's like really difficult for people to look at. And you shouldn't also feel, by the way, that you have to make work that's like super easy to assimilate. Um, you know, remember, it's, it's really about at the end of the day, you know, it really is your, your choice. You know, like there are plenty of ways to like make a living out there that, that don't involve making art and, and, and doing it with making art is, is really, really challenging. Um, so if you, you want to paint something that is really, really hard, probably, you know, you want to expect, and this is, I, I don't want to sound like a dream crusher, but you want to expect that it's going to be harder, you know? Um, but also that you should, if you believe in it, you got to stick with it. I don't think you really have a choice. If you really believe in it, like, you, you can't just switch that off. So, so I say go for it, you know? Um, but just be prepared because it's going gonna, it's gonna to test your resolve for sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, that was a long digression. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for some questions or comments um, about uh, about this about success. Yeah. Oh yeah. Some uh, uh, someone was commenting that the the Patreon link in my description goes to uh, a 404 link, so it's it's not working for some reason. Um, 
thank you for mentioning that. I'll, I'll have to fix that after the uh, stream. Um, let's see. Goka, uh, Goku Dinesh says, some of the old masters were way too advanced by the time they were 18 or 19. Do you think we as a generation are too distracted to achieve that level? That's a kind of cool question because it kind of uh, it takes uh, into account um, or, or it, it, it requests us to take into account like what was going on with like the old masters? Like how did they so uniformly make like incredible work? One of, the, one of the things, of course, was that the... Now, what we call ateliers nowadays are a little bit dissimilar to what ateliers were, I think, in the past, in that, like, ateliers in the past were, like, the workshops of, you know, famous, or not maybe not famous, but, but professional artists who were, like, kind of out there making a living, and, and uh, very young people, in fact, would go and uh, uh, an apprentice you know, at these, at these ateliers. And so they would learn, like, the kind of the trade of, of painting. Uh, and then eventually, like a lot of times, they would go to an academy, right? Like in the city or wherever, to, to actually, you know, fully learn, like, the craft of, like, drawing and painting and so on. Um, uh, and that would be their, their trajectory into the professional life of an artist. Um, Nowadays, like ateliers are a little bit, they're, they're schools essentially, they're, they're, they're schools started by various artists, like uh, um, not dissimilar to, you know, like I'm sharing what I know about drawing and painting on, on, my, uh, on my Patreon page and it's called the Atelier Tier and uh, yeah, that's basically, it's a, it's a school. Um, so one of the, 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 the factors that, that creates, you know, these, these incredible artists is that they were training in this from a very young age, uh, which is not to like, you know, say, oh, just go to sleep on it. Don't, don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> you don't need to push yourself. Um, but it is that, that we kind of have to play uh, catch up a little bit, I think, to, um, uh, to actually uh, get to a place where maybe we're we're making work that is qualitatively on a level, I mean, if we can, like that is qualitatively on, on the level with um, a lot of these, these artists in, in history. Right, so Victor Perry says, I find that David Katsan is a great example of an artist that paints what matters to him and not just pretty subjects. And even then his work is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, listen, that is, a, that is a perfect example of somebody who uh, who paints what they care about, has managed to become successful and, uh, uh, and known for that. Um, so so that's, that's it, right? Like, and if you would have told him, oh, well, David, to become successful, like, you can't paint these things that you care about. Imagine that. That's terrible. That's horrible. Like, like to think that, that that would be, like, that would be the option that you, you have to face. So I don't really believe in that. I, I think that you, you have to find a confluence in between the two. And, you know, you can look at artists like that as, as inspiration and say that, listen, like, if he can do it, it's certainly not impossible. Like, you know, you just have to, again, you know, be tenacious, be committed, um, and also probably be a little bit flexible. You know, it, it might not come exactly in the form that you, that you thought it would. You know, like, many is the story of an artist that was, like, thinking, oh, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and it's going to work out like this, this, and this, and then eventually they find that, that their career is something a little bit different than what they initially thought it would be. Uh, and, and, that's, and that should be like, that should be okay, you know, because if you're lucky enough to be able to find your niche and do the work that you love and be paid to do it, uh, I think there are a few things out there um, that, are, that are more gratifying than that. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Joseph Buckley says, I really want this girl's porcelain white skin and magenta orange red purple hair to shine through in this one. Excited to see what you do. Yeah, me too. I got to see if I can actually get that. Jasmine is asking, do you think it's possible for an artist today to have the same success artists as like Picasso did? Uh, I mean like global acclaim. Now, now this was interesting um, maybe to, to, to bring up in, in relationship to this because... I was, um, for this, uh, I, I don't know, I don't want to tell anything specific about it because 
uh, of the story. But uh, so I was asked to do this like kind of interview type thing. They send you a bunch of questions, and you um, you're supposed to like write down your answers to them, and uh, and then like they make a feature on their website about that. And one of the questions is like, what do you see as like the role of artists in society these days or nowadays? You know, and the question like really threw me like a lot more than I thought it would. Because it seems like a pretty like simple question, like, oh, what, what do artists do in society? And I don't know. I mean, like, obviously, our role has changed massively from what it once was, right? Like, think about it before the camera. Artists were the only people that could, like, capture an image of a place, right? You know, think of the... Um, Think of the Hudson Valley School of, of painters, right? These uh, Albert Beardstadt and Thomas Cole and these artists that made these like tremendous, you know, land, massive landscapes that, that were, you know, like symphonies themselves, you know? When you look at, at, at paintings like that, like imagine that was taking place. Now, by the way, not all of it, I'm sure. But some of that was taking place before photographs predominated as a visual medium, right? Um, and then you could walk in and see this painting by, you know, like I said, Thomas Cole or, or Beardstadt. It was like this majestic, amazing, crazy sunset, you know, with like magenta clouds and, you know, I mean, whatever, like madness. If you know their work, the Hudson Valley School, and you know what I'm talking about, like it's this really like super impressive uh, work. Um, and then kind of along comes the camera. And while it can't capture, you know, things in exactly the same way, it produces a facsimile that's a kind of convincing enough that it eventually, of course, it replaces landscape painters as the great capturers of, of those images. So when you ask, like, well, can you be successful in the same way that those artists were in history? Or, or sorry, um, you asked that, and then they, the, the question that I was posed in this interview was, what is the role of an artist in society? And I was like, well, we're not really the picture makers. I think that in some ways, like the role of an artist nowadays, like if we, if we kind of break it down to like the, what, what the process of art making is, you know, and I, I can only really just speak for myself here. I'm not going to try to uh, communicate something as a, a broad whole of a, of a movement of realist painting, uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit too ambitious. But, like for myself, I know a few things are true. I know that what is appreciated in my work is that, that people see kind of my hand and my vision in it. And I know how that happens is that I don't copy what I see. I I interpret what I see, right? Like I look at the themes that are present and I choose the most pleasing and harmonious version of them as, as it is according to my eye. So I think in a way like painters nowadays are maybe a little bit like, I don't know, like poets in history where people don't rely on us to necessarily like tell tell the story, right? Like, that would be what movies do. You know, when there's a, when there's a great story to be told, it's being told in movies. Uh, or, or animation, or, or lots of different ways. Um, uh, so, but, but we, are, we are there, like, I think, meditating on and musing on communicating about what we find, like, very special and very beautiful in the visual world. Uh, so, so that maybe is the best I could come to, like, what is an artist's role in, in, in society? Uh, I think it's to, you know, find those things which are interesting to us and show or communicate what about them we find interesting. Uh, now, that sounds like it's really unambitious, but I, I think if you're a painter, you understand uh, that this is actually a very... Uh, it's a very great task to, to call yourself to action for. Yeah. So, let's see here. Oh, so can be, like, artists be as successful or, or renowned as Picasso? And I don't think realist painters necessarily can. Uh, but, of course, he wasn't a realist painter. 
Let's see. Emmanuel Aliou says, uh, Sir, I'm not sure if you saw the community post on Patreon, but I was able to draw most of the cast drawing, but I couldn't finish quite enough. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's, uh, I'm just going to move on to a question that's uh, related to the topic here. Bagus Alit says, Hi Stephen, just curious about the artists who make it in a single night, because this phenomenon is quite often now, especially because NFTs are a thing. Any advice or story to maintain the success? That, well, that's, that's kind of an interesting one too. I mean, I, I just I'll relate it to some of my experiences, you know, um, uh, yeah, at different times, you know, I've, I've had varying levels of success with various exhibitions or, uh, or commission work or, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of experience a bit of success as an artist. And I can remember I found it really frustrating when I was, uh, when I was younger. Like I would, I would go through, I would say like have an exhibition in the, in the, the south of Sweden. There was this, uh, when I was living there, there was this exhibition that would take place in the, in the summers. Um, and I would send a bunch of work to it. And one year, uh, for whatever reason, like I, just like everything I sent there just like went off the walls like fast, like in a minute, right? Not in a minute, but you get what I mean. Like I was getting calls from the gallerists like, uh, oh, we sold this one. Oh, we sold that one. Oh, we sold this one. And I thought, oh, great. Great. Fantastic. I, this, is, this is a niche. This is a place where whatever I'm doing, for whatever reason, is really appreciated. And so the next, I was, I vowed, like, I was like, oh, the next year, you know, I'm going to come back and I'm going to, I'm going to just spin it back. I'm going to do really good work um, and I'm going to frame it up the same way. I'm going to do everything. I'm just going to repeat my process, you know, and, and uh, eventually, like, the, the next year, you know, I sent all my work over and it was really nice and I'd invested in the frames because I'd made some money the following year and, or the previous year and I didn't sell anything. And so one of the things I kind of realized is that, well, like, first of all, success in art is, is fleeting, you know, it, or at least like that kind of professional success, you know, like you have a good group of sales or whatever, it can just as easy, easily kind of not happen the next time, uh, which is a great reason to like not measure your success based on, you know, like how, uh, how much you sell at, at XYZ gallery or XYZ show um, uh, to try to kind of keep yourself a little bit grounded. Um, but the other thing too to remember is that actually it really is about like keeping it fresh. Like I, I don't think that, um, I don't think that necessarily people that appreciate realism actually just want to see the same thing over and over again. I mean, there's an extent to which, you know, some artists are able to be kind of repetitive and experience, I, I think, some commercial success in, in doing that. However, I think, you know, in terms of like art appreciation, I think that people do like you to kind of keep it, they like to see, in a way, a new, a new twist. They like to see you grow and they like to see you innovate and they like to see you uh, emerge and, and go through different subject matter. So I would just say, like, try to keep yourself, like, fresh and vital and, uh, and, and don't think that you can maybe just, like, spin it back because, because one thing, like, came out kind of good, you know, or, or had a good response. Like, you see this on social media all the time. Uh, you know, like, I know, like, in my, in my, you know, social media work, like, I'll make one post and it's like really, really popular, usually in a totally unexpected way. Like you don't, you just think, oh, this will be whatever, I'll just post this. Uh, for whatever reason, it gets really picked up. You initially think, oh, well, I'll just do that over and over again, or I'll like just optimize that to make, you know, to make it the best version of what it is. And I think what you realize eventually is that no, it, it was just, it was very fresh and it was an interesting take and people want to see more fresh and interesting takes. Um, so I just think, like, keep yourself stimulated and, uh, you know, excited about what you're doing. And I think kind of trust the, uh, trust the process a bit there. In terms of, like, overnight success, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've never experienced anything as a realist painter overnight. Uh, so I, I have, uh, I don't really have any place to, to comment about that, actually. <laughs> um, let's see. So... Let's see. I'm just looking for some more uh, questions related to this topic. Jim Ellison says, many artists feel the need to reinvent themselves. Do you think this is done because they feel they have 
wander from their views of success or due to boredom, boredom in a direction? Yeah, well, you know, I just got through with saying, I think, you know, keeping yourself fresh and excited is, is probably the most important thing. Um, and so I think like a lot of artists, whether like consciously or unconsciously, I, I think probably, and, and this is another thing, you know, about, I think, successful artists, uh, is that it's easy to think that they're like, they're cynically going about it. Like most of them are really kind of genuinely, I think, going about what they do and, and, and they're on their own like artistic journey. And just because they maybe they're really good communicators or they're really tapped in or they really understand you know, themselves or their audience really well, they're able to be kind of successful doing it. It doesn't mean that it's disingenuous. So, so I, don't, I don't think that maybe a lot of artists are out there going like, oh, is it, you know, it's May 1st, time for another reinvention. Um, but also maybe in the back of their mind, you can say that, that, yeah, like they understand just staying the same. Maybe that doesn't keep it fresh for them. It doesn't keep it fresh for their audience either, you know? So uh, a, good, a good mixture of, um, you know, something new and something old is probably, uh, probably the, the best option. By the way, I don't know how, at all how my progress on this painting is going. I'm barely paying attention to it. I think it's kind of coming along okay, but, uh, but it has a, a long, long way to go. Um, Carlos Campos is asking a question in Spanish. I'm sorry, Carlos, I can't, uh, I, I don't speak the language, so I can't do it. Joseph Buckley says, perhaps the role of an artist nowadays is to communicate a vibe that words can't describe, providing hope to those who've not seen it, or perhaps just to provide something beautiful to admire. Yeah, like I think that's, you know, Joseph, I'm really with you. And, and I, the only amendment that I would make is, uh, is using the word just to, to say about, you know, something beautiful to admire. You know, somehow we, we, we maybe trick ourselves into thinking because something is very innate or very instinctive that it's that it's just something i think that a lot of life and a lot of the world is based on you know having something beautiful to admire you know i mean that's it's been a motivator throughout all of history uh you know the 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 search for for great beauty and great um uh you know things to to kind of admire uh, things that that fascinate us uh and so like as artists you know, we have our own barometer of our own fascination to use as a, as a map, you know, as a, as a, as a compass. Um, because just so you know, like most of you, just like me, you're all like really normal people. <laughs> and if you like something, if you find something really cool, there's a really good chance that there's a lot of other people out there just like you that also find that thing, you know, kind of cool and kind of interesting. Uh, so that's one great reason to kind of follow your gut because, again, you know, you're, you have so much shared humanity. Um, you know, you have so much that, that you have in common with uh, a lot of people out there in the world. And that is, is really a great asset and a great strength um, uh, for artists because if you really truly come to kind of understand yourself and your own motivations and your own interests and your own joys, then, then that means also that you're starting to understand a lot about a lot about the people around you as well. Right, so making art in a busy world. Oh wait, no, sorry, I skipped over a couple comments. Uh, Lav Yeros is saying, that is exactly why NASA has an art program. Paul Calais drawings from Apollo era are so great. Fascinating stuff, Lav Ross, I've got to track that down. I, I haven't, I, I've actually heard of the, the whole NASA like artist program thing, but I, I only like peripherally, like I've just kind of heard of it. I, have, I never really like tracked anything down about it. Um, but that sounds really, uh, really fascinating, really interesting. Jim Ellison says, can you recommend any books on how to improve visual storytelling? Ouch, I don't think I can. Um, I mean, that's just, uh, um, it's, an, it's a great question. Uh, and I know that there are books out there. I just, I, off the top of my head, I don't have any of them just registered uh, at the moment. Making Art in a Busy World says, part of the problem with being successful is that the artist has to be a businessman and know how to market their artwork, and that is not really taught. Instead, we focus on our craft. You know, this is an interesting point, too, and I, I was, um, I've kind of uh, mentioned a few things kind of about this earlier, you know, um, in, in the stream. 
but that like in general, you know, I try to be really open-minded in terms of looking at how thi different things can combine, which is to say that, you know, do art and business have to be like enemies with each other? Like, I, I, I really don't think they have to be enemies. I just think that, you know, again, I mean, and it seems different when you're younger, but like I'm, I'm 40 now and, you know, I spent so much time like figuring out Norwegian tax law and like, yeah, there's just like so much admin in life uh, the idea that as an artist somehow you'd be able to totally escape it is like borders on crazy like of course you're gonna have to figure out how to to do all that stuff and and, and yeah like it I think one of the one of the big difficulties that you face is actually I think the perceived like group attitude about you know art and business you know like I know that when I was uh, younger like going through school like art and business was like ooh that's like evil like you know you don't want you don't want anything to do with business like you know art it's like this pure thing and if it touches business then everything about that's bad and like i i've definitely realized that that's it's not the case i mean in in a sense you know if you look like throughout history all of the great like uh, blossoming of like artistic growth in a society has come along with like great in a way like financial success also like the renaissance was not like a bunch of poor artists that were also geniuses it's because you you could really make a phenomenal living i think as an artist you know and 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 there was a lot of like investment in that in that arena i think some of what's difficult nowadays like i remember i was talking with um a guy who sees an editor of um, uh, some art magazines and curator of, of, of various shows uh, and uh, and he was saying like oh well, where are all the multi-figure paintings you know like artists nowadays you just don't see them composing like multi-figure paintings in the way that say uh, the the greats of history have done and what I was probably too shy to say at the time but I'll be happily happy say happy to say on this live stream was that well, where where is the market for those things like, if you expect artists to take, by the way, if you've ever tried to make a multi-figure painting, you understand, like, you're talking a minimum of, you know, six months to a year to, to get to a, a result. And that's, that's if you're, like, a fast painter. You know, you got ten figures on the canvas, you know, all of them are life-size. You're talking years of investment of your time. And as an artist, like, right now, it's like a really difficult market for that, you know, like, so you might be investing, you know, a year and a half of your time and the return on that financially might be like a goose egg, which is like what, zero, uh, which is like, I mean, if, if like, I don't know who can sustain that. Like, I don't know what artist out there, uh, is, you know, unless you're independently just, you know, as wealthy as can be, uh, could really afford to actually kind of do that. Um, uh, so wait, I, I kind of lost the plot on the, on the question. Um, uh, the question was something maybe about like uh, business and art and craft and stuff. Uh, but I just wanted to say, you know, I don't know what I wanted to say. Unfortunately, I totally lost the plot on that one. Ah, but great, the great flowerings of like artwork and history and, uh, and how they, they came about. You know, a lot of it, a lot of it was like that there was investment in that in that arena and that as an artist, you could go into making these, uh, you know, Titian was probably was paid probably incredibly well uh, or, or at least compensated in some way incredibly well uh, for his giant altarpieces. He didn't do them on speculation. He didn't do them because maybe he could sell them like uh, there was there was a way that you could make a living doing that. And there was a market that kind of supported that. And uh, if you know, uh, as a, an art appreciator or a collector, you want to somehow facilitate that, you got to make it easy for artists to, to, to stretch the legs and, and try that out because, you know, um, you know, monthly bills and rent and things, they don't disappear because you did a, a good multi-figure painting. That's the reality. That's a harsh reality. Um, let's see, what are the other questions here? 
Susan P. Faust is saying, people are endlessly fascinated with the human face and its expressions and what is revealed of the human soul. A never exhausted subject. So true. So true. Saturn M is asking, is it more difficult to be successful doing figure drawings or paintings as opposed to portraits? Th this is a kind of cool question. And, and I mean, if you know, if you've been following my work for a long time, you know that like, uh, I'm a huge enthusiast for anatomy and, uh, and, and figure drawing and figure painting. I, I love it. I've taught it for years and things. Um, however, uh, when you get onto social media, which is, again, it's kind of my workplace. It's, you know, it's my job to be uh, an artist and instructor on, on social media. Um, there are a lot of like very touchy rules around like nudity and, and the figure. Uh, and so it's actually really difficult um, for me to do any kind of like to tell anybody what I'm doing in terms of like nude figures or anatomy. Uh, and so I, as a consequence of that, I, I, can't, I can't really do it sustainably. Uh, however, uh, I do have plans also to, um, to include figure drawing in the atelier tier in the, uh, in the long and short term. It's just, I just have to figure out a way to, to make sure that uh, I can let people know what's going on uh, without kind of triggering any, uh, any negative result from, from the social media platforms that I'm on. Which, by the way, oh, let me just say, I, I always forget to do this. Uh, and uh, as everybody's watching, uh, I, and I'm appreciating that, that you're all here, uh, please uh, just uh, hit the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel if you can. It really helps kind of boost the, uh, the stream out there and, and lets more people see it. And that's, uh, that really helps me out. And, um, uh, and yeah, so if you like the stream, please, please just hit that like button and subscribe. And um, that would be super cool. Right, so on to other questions here. Carlos Campos is saying, oh, uh, Weary Pilgrim is saying that Carlos Campos is speaking, speaking Portuguese, but I know Spanish, so the translation isn't 100% accurate, but he's congratulating your work and saying, and your amazing explanations. Well, thank you so much, Carlos Campos, and, and certainly to Weary Pilgrim for translating. All right, let's see. Yeah, a couple of people have mentioned the uh, links to my Patreon page are not working actually on the uh, on the description. I I'm going to fix that, I think, as soon as we get off the uh, stream here. So thank you for letting me know. Um, and I, I think actually, like I might, we've been at this for maybe a couple hours. No, about an hour and a half. I'm going to do a little bit, little bit longer. I have some more kind of anecdotes <laughs> about, um, about success maybe to, to share. One of the things that I thought was like really uh, useful to, to kind of share with you guys about uh, about success, about being successful, uh, is it's really, it's all about like, you know, taking one step at a time. Like someone earlier mentioned like this idea that like everybody now is, is becoming successful in a, in a hot minute because of, because of NFTs or whatever. And uh, um, I mean, maybe there's some, some truth in that, uh, but I just know any success like in my career that I've experienced is because I was really well prepared for it, meaning I'd been working towards that success for, for quite a long time um, and, and that it, in no way did it feel like it arrived uh, kind of overnight. So even these people that, that right now, maybe you're, you're thinking, oh, they're, they're, they're claiming this success so fast. Well, they've been working probably behind the scenes for years, uh, you know, perfecting their craft, building their audience and uh, getting to a place where they're, they're ready actually to kind of experience that success. I mean, that's another thing, you know, and, and it's, you know, as tried and true as, as time itself, uh, but that, you know, success is a combination of uh, a preparedness and opportunity. So like you, you really, you know, want to lay the groundwork by being, you know, consistent and, and hardworking. I think that no matter what kind of route eventually you take to the success that you're searching for, uh, very likely it is going to be paved with, with hard work and, and, and preparation and consistency. Um, I, I don't think you just, you don't get those stories very often of, uh, of people who are like, yeah, no, I was totally unprepared and I'd never uh, actually tried anything. And then all of a sudden I was like super, <clears throat> excuse me, I was like super successful. <laughs> like you never seem to hear that on these uh, interviews of really uh, famous and successful people. Um, so uh, for yourself, you know, I think it is a little bit about kind of understanding, you know, where you want to go, but also 
understanding like who's gone there before. Um, I think that's a great way to um, to kind of grasp and understand, you know, what what you need to do to kind of become successful. Because for sure, like you're not the first person, uh, or in 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 almost every case, you're not going to be the first person that's been trying to succeed in this field. So so watching, you know, what other people have done. Uh, and finding out how those those habits that led to their success can be integrated into your life without, uh, again, without like compromising what you kind of think and feel about about your your work, you know. Um, so just be like humble, I think, and attentive to the professionals in your field. I'm always looking at at, at other art educators and going, like, "Wow, I'm so impressed by how they do this and that and the other thing." Uh, and and I know like uh, everybody I've, I've been asked before like oh what artists do you really admire out there I admire all of them like and I, I want to do a little bit of like all of them like do something really well and and that's you know what I look at and go oh that's what I I want to learn from from that artist so uh, I think just yeah like being humble and being prepared you know those are two things that that are always going to I think go along with um, uh, with becoming successful. All right, let's see. A lot of questions coming in. Bagos Alit says, what about someone who makes art as a hobby and doing great on social media, but when they quit their job and start to commit to art, the success is just too overwhelming and start to destroy the artist? Uh, that's a tricky question, I guess. I mean, obviously, you know, there's something in that equation that that wasn't in harmony i guess is is the the way i would think about it you know like i said you know so much of of what you do means that you have to create a balance in between sometimes conflicting things you know i mean l let's be real like there is a little bit of conflict in between you know business and 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 art making like i didn't really become an artist to become a business person uh, and sometimes if you allow the business to be out of balance, right? To take over, yeah, for sure, it can be to the detriment of the of the artistic expression. Uh, the point I'm I'm usually trying to make is that it doesn't have to, uh, but certainly it it can. You know, um, I was talking actually in the failure podcast about uh, not podcast in the failure live stream about how when I started Patreon, it was kind of a response to a. A really traumatic, like failing event in in my in my life, and you know, eventually, you know, the success I discovered that my success was going to come from a slightly different place. Um, actually, sorry, I just lost the plot again. That happens to me more than I would like to admit. <clears throat> By the way, so the painting is kind of progressing now. You can see that there's a good like amount of form. Like a lot of what's happening in it actually is responsible, you know, or is coming out of the kind of graphite. And part of my vision for this one was to try and actually paint it, I guess, in a way like as little as possible. Like I wanted as much of the drawing to to exist as I could while accentuating it with the best qualities of an oil painting. Uh, and so far, I feel like I'm kind of, you know, I'm getting that, that vibe from it. Almost has like the, um, the appearance of like a, an egg tempera painting in a way that it has that sense of like transparency and kind of muted chroma that I associate with a lot of, you know, for instance, like if you look at Andrew Wyeth's, um, his egg tempera paintings, you know, they have uh, a strong, you know, vibe in that, in that direction. And I really like that about this. It's the, really that gray underneath uh, that that I, I think actually is really being a great asset, really a great benefit uh, to to what the painting is doing right now. I'm kind of trying to figure out how much I do or don't like want to paint the shapes in the hair, and I am completely undecided about that. You know, it could be interesting to like integrate that color, but then it also is kind of interesting how really the face, the light is just kind of popping out because of this like darker outline here. If you, uh, <laughs> if you have an opinion, tell me in the, in the comments and I'll, uh, I, will, I will use it to, uh, to weigh my, uh, my decision making about whether or not I actually go through and paint the, the hair. I won't take it on a popular vote, but I will, I will use it uh, as a consideration. 
Let's see. Emmanuel Alu is asking, what's an NFT? That's a long conversation, Emmanuel. M maybe, you know what? Maybe on one of my live streams, I'll do an NFT conversation. Actually, that could be an interesting one for the next live stream. Let's see. Lucas Hernandez Nasciamento is saying, could you mention a reference on how you start your own mood board? Sorry, I know it's not on subject, but it sounds super interesting to, uh, to pursue. Yeah, like a mood board, I, I think, by the way, actually, it, it can really be on, on topic. Because, you know, in the, in the conversation that I brought up the mood board earlier, what I was saying that I think, I think to be a successful student, you know, one of the major hurdles that you have to get over is that you don't actually have the language to say what it is about what you like. Now, now that sounds like really harsh, right? But what I mean is, is, you know, for all of you that are of age to consume alcohol, right? If you're like me, you don't mind drinking wine. You really enjoy a good glass of wine. But do I have the language to describe exactly what I like about each glass of wine? Two glasses of wine that taste very, very similar. Could I articulate exactly what the difference was in between them? I don't have the language for it, right? Uh, and so what a mood board is trying to do uh, is it's trying to help you sift through all of the different and disparate things that you appreciate to help you understand, in contrast, what you like about them. Because believe it or not, when you like a painting, oftentimes it's not, it's not completely 100% of the painting that you like. There's, there's things about paintings that I love that I don't even like the painting, but I love this thing in the painting, right? I'm sure we've all been there. I know, I know that you've kind of experienced that because again, like, you know, we're all pretty, pretty similar. Um, so what is it then? How do you identify the characteristics of those things which you do appreciate? Uh, so mood board is, is kind of putting that out instead of being like up here and being like really nebulous and really kind of unsure of it, it brings it out here and it puts it in front of us. And that allows us to be a little bit more kind of accountable, a little bit more specific about what we like and what we don't like about a particular painting. And that informs our taste and our taste then becomes our judgment, right? So, you know, when I think of paintings that I want to make, I mean, I could paint anything. Choosing what to paint is an artistic choice. And if I choose it randomly, I'm unlikely to tell the, the best version of the story of, of in my artwork or my appreciation that, I, that I'm capable of, right? Uh, so it's just trying to give you the, uh, the language and the tools to express or to understand like what you want to express. Or in the case of a student, what you actually want to learn, right? Not all painting education is the same. I know it, you know it. Uh, so you need to be like a very discerning uh, consumer, I think, of, of your art education. Uh, there are cases where maybe, um, there are cases where maybe you're going to be in a situation as a student where you don't know what you don't know. And so it can be useful to you to just be patient and just listen to the context of what's going on. And maybe you gain something that you didn't even know that you wanted. Uh, but, but also you shouldn't just, you know, blindly allow someone to, to kind of walk you into your education. You should be very conscious of it. Um, making a mood board basically is just choosing the works that, that you really appreciate and really enjoy, putting them all together on, a, on, a, on the same like uh, visual plane. So I use like a Photoshop uh, file or Photoshop project, uh, and then just kind of comparing and contrasting in between them. I'll, I'll probably one day like do a mood board video uh, just because, like I said, it's becoming increasingly apparent to me actually, you know, how important this topic is for students. Uh, and so like I want to, I want to do like a fully fleshed out version of, of like what, what mood boards are kind of all about and how to use them to kind of understand your influences. Let's see. I'm just looking for some questions that are on topic here. Weary Pilgrim says, do you think the world would come around on this overnight exposure and start to appreciate more the years you've put into your craft? I think fast success is starting to feel shallow. I, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where 
I try to I try to maintain a, a really great sense of perspective about any successes that I that I experience. There there was a um, I don't know if you, you you all remember this, but previous to like internet learning, there was like audio learning. So there was this company called the uh, the Teaching Company. And they made uh, all these, they recorded like these great lecturers from universities. And one of them was this lecturer on music. Oh, I'm not going to remember his name right. I'm not going to remember it right, but it's like Daniel Green or something. Oof, I'm going to have to come back to that. But he made one of the most fantastic, fantastic lecture series. And it was about like the history of music. Now we're talking the history of music from basically the, the first uh, recorded, not re like recorded audi audibly, but recorded like in some way uh, uh, documented, was a Greek drinking song that was inscribed on a tombstone. And he goes all the way from there up until like, uh, like expressionist Russian symphonies from the 1960s, you know? So it's this huge gamut of information, fascinating from start to finish, an amazing lecturer. Listen, if I remember his name or I can track it down, I'll put it in the, the description of this video. Uh, I would recommend it to absolutely anybody that had interest or no interest in music. Uh, you know, it was the thing that really kind of broadened my horizon about, about that uh, in general. Um, but he was telling a story about an Italian opera composer. I, I believe that it was Monteverdi, but I'm willing to be wrong about that. Because <laughs> there's Verdi and then there's Monteverdi. In any event, this guy was, um, he had gotten his first really big commission for, uh, I think it was like three operas. And he was meant to produce them in this period of time. And there was like one that was going to be like... Um, uh, a tragedy or something, and, and two that were supposed to be comedies. And during the time that he's composing, like, the first of the comedies, like, his wife and his two daughters, like, all die of, like, cholera or something, right? And he's, like, in the middle of composing this comedic opera, it's like King Lear or something, right? And obviously, he's not in a state of mind to get anything anything done in that respect, but he is compelled to do so. And so he does it. And at the opening night of it, it is, it is hissed and booed like out of the theater. Like the, 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 the audience <laughs> just absolutely let him have it and he was mortified by it. Now he went on to be like one of the most successful and acclaimed composers in, in history. And so we know that the story ends well. But he was writing a letter to a friend. Uh, and he said, and I'll paraphrase because I always paraphrase because I never remember the exact quote. Just like I don't remember the exact name of the guy. Uh, but he said that, you know, I'm at this point in my career and in my life. If I listen to the applause, then I have to listen to, to also the, the, the people that say I'm terrible. So I can't listen to either one, right? And what he's talking about there is about being self-motivated and kind of knowing yourself and, and understanding your own value. And, and, and that's always very challenging. But I, I just thought it was really fascinating because it is this story about someone who realizes in this moment that, that like harsh critique and great applause are really the same thing, you know? Uh, and, and, and in fact, you can't put too much stock in either of them. Because if you start evaluating yourself from that perspective, you know, if you start evaluating yourself based on, on the applause, then you also have to evaluate yourself based on the, uh, um, the boos and the, the, the people saying that, that, that you're terrible. So I think, you know, confidence is such a big deal for an artist. And I know also, I mean, you know, this is another like very personal detail for me. Uh, is that actually like my early years at the academy, the critiques hit me really, really hard because like I, I'm already like pretty self-critical. I think a lot of artists like share this, that, that we all, you know, we look at our work and go, oh man, it could be so much better. Everybody's better than me and yada, 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 all that stuff. 
um, but I was really like that. I didn't really, I didn't really have a great sense of myself at the time. But you know, it wasn't probably until I met my wife that that really I I feel like I got a grip on my own value and and understood, you know, yeah, like just understood that regardless of like what happened, like I made a bad painting. Pfft. So what? Like that that doesn't like really define me, you know. And I, I think that you know you do you do really have to kind of reach that point in your life where you you do start to understand that uh, if you're going to I think deal with some of the rises and falls that you're going to have in terms of success and and failure. Robert Greenberg, thank you so much. Somebody in the comments, uh, remember the name of the composer? It's or not composer, but the 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 lecturer. It's Robert Greenberg. He is fantastic. Uh, if you go to like Audible or something, I think you can find his lectures still. Let's see. Saturn M is asking, what strategies did you employ after graduating from Florence Academy to elevate your technique or style in order to reach the level of achieving recognition in sales? You know, it's a cool question. It de definitely relates to success um, in the sense that and I remember actually, so there was a student, um, we would have these final critiques uh, and when I was teaching in Sweden at the academy there in, uh, in uh, Göteborg, um, there was a student graduating and she had this question. She was like, so you're looking at all my work from, from this last term and I'm graduating right now and I'm going to go out there in the world. Like, what do you think is the thing as you look at my work? Like, what should I work on? You know, like, what's the thing? She was basically trying to say, like, well, what's the thing I'm weak in? And, and like, where, where do you see the weaknesses in my, in my work? Because I want to work on that and I want to get better at that. And, you know, we, we all kind of sat there and thought about it. And, and my response to her was just that the reality is you should be improving in every aspect of your work. None of them are sufficient. And that's not because you're not sufficient, but it's because you need to grow everywhere. If you kind of look at your work uh, and, and try to, I think, do it like piecemeal, like, okay, now I'm going to improve uh, the color, or now I'm going to improve the design, or not, like all these things are like tied together, you know, like even good, good color actually helps you see and understand better good value. Uh, so it, it's very hard to kind of take these things a la carte and like to take one thing out uh, and, and, you know, without compromising or, or changing completely the, the equation. Uh, so in terms of like what I did, when I left the academy, um, I'm just gonna like like real talk. I, I actually needed to learn how to really draw. There are a lot of different like schools of of you know design and conceptualization when it comes to to kind of learning to draw and paint. And as a professional, uh, I'm a really big believer uh, in kind of linear three-dimensional structural drawing, right? Um, the opposing view to that, of course, would be like flat 2D design, and which is very popular nowadays, actually. It's, it's, it's a very postmodern idea in some senses, but it's also been around for a long time. Um, but I feel like if you're going to get really good at like, like drawing, if you think that I'm pretty good at drawing, the reason I'm pretty good at drawing is because I have a conceptual three-dimensional understanding of the head and of the features of the head, uh, and I use that with every brush stroke I kind of put onto the, onto the canvas. Um, and I, I had to, to re-educate. I mean, I, I, started, I started doing that actually by, by looking at Rodin's work. Um, I started by looking at a sculptor because, of course, like sculptors, I mean, who knows that 3D world? Uh, better than, than sculptors and the way that Rodin's works in particular, the Burgers of Calais, uh, they were a major, 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 major influence on me um, in my immediate postgraduate years. And I did studies of his work uh, as much as I could, you know, I just find as good a picture as I could uh, on, the, on the internet and I would do drawings and drawings and drawings of the, the head studies that he did. And the way that he was like kind of carving forms and finding rhythms and uh, uh, basically, you know, just trying to unpack through master study, like his thinking and his reflections about uh, about form and about construction and about three dimensionality and rhythm and and all of his ideas. Like those were things that, you know, I was coming from this totally visual paradigm where it was just, you know, squint down and look at the shapes. And 
you know, as I say that, I know that probably for most of you that won't resonate like how different exactly that is. But just take my word for it. It's different universes, not, not different worlds. Uh, and so, you know, for me, that was really big. And that, that, was, that was, you know, me having to change, I mean, not everything. But I had to change a lot of things, I think, to, to turn into the, the painter that I am today. It's not like I didn't graduate from the academy and then like, guess what, now you can paint and draw. Like, I was okay. And, you know, if I had never learned anything more, I'm sure I could have, you know, over the years done okay for myself and figured some things out. Uh, but it was very important for me to actually see what the other side of the coin was about, see what form was really about. And, uh, and so that's what I, that I, that's what I kind of worked on, you know. Um, at the same time, you know, there's another actually anecdote from Sweden that I think is relevant here. There's another painter, really fantastic landscape painter called Zachariah Kramer. Uh, he's an American dude uh, from Colorado. And uh, he was a student there when I was teaching in Sweden. Uh, I mean, he was, he was very good. So he was one of those students where it's like, yeah, like he was a student while I was teaching, but I, I think he knew a lot already. Um, so I don't, I, I don't want to take any uh, credit for it. I mean, he's, he's just very good at what he does. But, no, what was I going to say? Ah, yeah, so... So in terms of like as an artist, like how do you grow? You know, a lot of it is working on weaknesses, but at the same time, you know, like the, th the great thing about Zach was that like he graduated like from a school where it's studio painting and you're painting indoors and you're doing portraits and you're doing, uh, you're doing all this like really like indoorsy stuff, but he's a landscape painter. So what did he do after he graduated? Like he just went out and like lived in a cabin with like no hot water and <laughs> just... Every day it was just out there in the woods, you know, listening to birds and, and painting the scenery. Like, he completely immersed himself in something that was technically already a strength of his. You know, so there is an extent to which I feel like, you know, drilling down is really good. Because I think if you're going to become expert in something, you can't, you're not going to be like a jack of all trades and an expert, right? Uh, so I think you need to become proficient everywhere and excellent in maybe a few small places. I hope that is unambiguous enough to, to help. Um, uh, because I know it's a little bit, maybe not contradictory advice, but it's this, you know, a tricky element to it. Um, but it's a balance. Of course it's a balance. Everything is a balance, right? Okay, so let's see. Judith Slaughter is asking, Stephen, I'm enjoying this. I've been watching, and as I've done my husband's morning care, he was also listening, informed me that he really had enjoyed the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks so much, uh, Judith. Megan, uh, Megana Sony says, basic fundamental of drawing to learn for beginners, which book will help? Uh, it's all in my FAQs um, uh, on, on Patreon. Let's see, I'm just looking for some more questions that are on the topic. Cat K. Cat says, Some really great artists never meant to be greatly successful in their lifetime. Vermeer was not as popular as other artists in his time and totally forgotten for a long time. Yeah, this is back to that kind of uh, Verdi or Monteverdi point where it's like, you know, if Vermeer had listened to, to his, his critics, they would have said, oh, you need to paint more tulips, you know? Uh, and that's, what, that's what's popular, that's what sells. Um, and we might have missed out on, on all the great things that, that Vermeer gave us, right? So, uh, again, you, know, you, need, you do need to be able to, like, self-evaluate, um, but also, like, understand... Like, here, here's, here's an interesting point, right? So, about, like, chasing your art and chasing your vision, it's very easy for us to say, like, yeah, you need to, like, you need to be true to yourself and do exactly what you want to do. Well... What about like for like online instruction? What if, if, I, if I only taught the stuff that I personally found interesting and found totally stimulating, there would be a whole group of people and a whole segment of, of the educational process that would be underrepresented. So I like to actually listen to people and, and see what, what they're interested in learning and what, what aspects of, um, of the training they find most challenging, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, for me, that's, that's really, really useful. And I, I I think like in a lot of things in life, the more kind of secure you are in your, yourself, I think the easier it is to kind of listen to input about stuff like that. Uh, so like I think eventually, 
you know, it benefits you to get right with you and then, and then you can kind of, you know, find your way to also handle the world because it can be, it can be a little bit harsh, but it's not, you know, it's not going anywhere. If you're going to be successful, you gotta, you gotta deal with, you gotta deal with the world, right? Saturn M is asking, if you could achieve more success doing subject matter that isn't your favorite, is it better to pursue that route instead? Nope, I don't think so. 4 Hner says, love your video, Stephen. Enjoy the tangents. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Matthew Williams says, everything can be drawn using a basic geometric shapes and simple gestural lines as the basis. Really helps uh, by sketching from memory. Yeah, no, memory sketching is really good too. Yeah, so I think we're probably coming to the end of the stream here. I just want to check my notes and make sure I got uh, uh, all of the things that I wanted to say. Um, Oh yeah, you know, one thing also that I thought was interesting to think about uh, with, with success in terms of, you know, how we relate to it and stuff is, um, you know, when you, when you do put pressure on the product, right? Uh, so, so I'm talking now kind of basically about that dichotomy of like product versus process. When you, when you put some weight on the product, I think it puts a pressure on you to produce. And maybe our first reaction is to think, well... I, I, you know, you shouldn't feel that pressure. You should just feel free to like, you know, be on a journey and kind of search. But like, I, I do find actually, I'm someone who I respond. I like a little bit of pressure. I actually, kind of, it kind of motivates me a bit. Uh, and so, in some ways, like putting a a weight or a need for professional success on on my work, it actually it actually motivates me. I think it keeps me sharp. And and so. I don't mind it. Now, I just I just bring this up because, uh, again, to create like a balanced view of this, um, because I do feel like the easy advice to give is that yeah, you should just be on your journey and just do your own thing and don't listen to anybody and you know I just I just feel like it's, su it's such a rare thing in life where where actually that is how things work. I just think it's really rare and and if that's the way it works for you, that's fantastic. And I, I just want you to be on your journey and do your thing. Uh, in general, that's what I want, want for, for my students anyway. But like also, you know, not everybody's like A4. Not everybody like fits that same mold, you know. Like I said, for me, performance mattered. And, and, and uh, it took me actually a long time to even make peace with that because so often the advice you receive is in the contrary. The advice you receive is you can only think about the process. Um, and I tried that for years, and actually, it was a source of great frustration for me at, at times, you know, is that I was working and working and working and working and working, pouring my heart and soul and my life into this work, and I just wasn't producing very much because, like, I was, basically, I was spending all my time experimenting, just trying to figure out, what if I did this, or what if I did that, when, in fact, like, when, when you go to make work professionally, a lot of times... It's not necessarily about an experiment. I mean, you should have done your experimenting already. And then, and then when you need to, let's say you need to make 15 pieces for a solo exhibition, you don't want it to be one big experiment. Like, what if you show up at the end and none of those 15 works worked out? What do you do then? So, you know, being a professional, uh, again, a little bit of pressure, like I said, I think for me actually is, is in some ways like a, I view it as a very good thing. You don't have to but you can if you would like to, or if that kind of suits your mentality, you know. That's the other thing. It's not A4. Success in art is not all, like, in the same shape and size. Um, takes a lot of different expressions. But I think that's the end. I think I got to roll out. I got at least the face blocked in, and I actually I just kind of like this really, you know, really, like, low-key aesthetic. I love that gray coming through. I'm going to try as much as possible to actually kind of preserve... Uh, this kind of warmth in the shadow here and really not overpaint that and I think really I might I might really leave a lot of the hair as well uh, you know just with some of these kind of shapes around I love how it kind of draws your attention into into this area and then also like allows the background to still be a drawing I love that kind of dichotomy that, that exists there um, do remember May 3rd the first version of the Atelier tier is happening live on my Patreon page $10 to subscribe you get the live demonstration and uh, materials list, all that stuff. You're going to need to do the work yourself. You get the feedback video that happens later in the month. May 16th is the deadline to submit your work for the group critique video. 
Uh, and then, by the way, also with that subscription, you get access to like 200 hours of, of other tutorials. So uh, if you've been thinking about doing it, it's a great moment to like get started out with the Atelier tier because, like I said, it's happening the first one, May 3rd, and you can be there for the start and travel all the way through the curriculum with me. And also, by the way, everybody, thank you so much. Please put your suggestions for live stream topics into the comment section or put them on Patreon. Let me know somewhere like what topics you think are kind of interesting uh, and I'll kind of take that into consideration for whatever the next live stream is going to be. Thank you again so much and take good care of yourselves, okay? Thank <laughs> you.